Uh, last night I neglected uh, to introduce my family to you, so I want to do that real quick. They're here. Uh, but this is my wife, Laura, and uh, yes, uh, one of one of my uh, good friends uh, said that the greatest argument for the existence of God is that Laura married me. So. <laughs> Miracles do happen, guys, um, and we've been married for just over 12 years, and these are our two kids, Evan and Lena. So you'll see them around. They're here, and uh, love being a dad uh, is certainly one of the, the greatest joys of my life. So looking forward to this week, and this week we're talking about possible. And I want to use this word to sort of frame our reference as we work through Romans chapter 8. And as I uh, share with you last night, no way that we'll be able to touch everything that is in Romans chapter 8. Many have described this chapter as one of the greatest chapters in the Bible. It's so rich with, with, with gospel-centered theology. And so we're going to dive through Romans chapter 8 this week. But before we get to Romans chapter 8, as we think about possible, right? When we think about the word possible, we also have to think about the word what? Impossible. All right, we're all familiar with impossible, aren't we? Some of you, when you saw your theory exam yesterday, thought <laughs> impossible, right? Some of you, when you see the music that you're going to be performing this Saturday, when you see that music later on today, you're going to think impossible, all right? But it's not. It's possible, and I'm looking forward to that. But life has a way sometimes of, of bringing a cloud over possible, and so we're going to dive into that. But I wanted to start with one of my favorite verses, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And it says this, it says that we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. I love this verse because, first of all, it describes our identity in Christ. And I love the fact that God speaks over life, that we are his masterpieces, right? That the word there in Greek is where we get our word poem. So it says, you are well put together, a well-crafted masterpiece. You may not always think of yourself that way, but that's how God sees you. And this is that God created us anew in Christ Jesus. He saved us. He brought us into a relationship with himself by faith, by grace. So that, there's a purpose, so that we can do the good things that he has planned for our lives. God has a plan for your life. A divine possible that's been marked over your life. And, and what I want us to do this week is to see how the gospel and how Jesus make that possible possible. Are you with me? So we're going to dive into Romans chapter 8. So, thinking about God's plan for our life and God's purpose for our life. Let's look at Romans chapter 8, and uh, we'll just begin with verse 1. We'll try to work through the first four verses this morning. Romans chapter 8, uh, beginning in verse 1. It says, So now there is n there no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Now, Let's just stop for a moment and think about the, the, the weight and the implication of this verse. Paul says, and, and Paul's writing a letter to the church in Rome. It's a church that he greatly desired to visit and to minister to. We, we talked about that last night, Romans chapter 1. Paul says, I, I long to be with you and desire. And so he's writing the, this letter to the church. And he's already developed, as we get to chapter 8, the reality that all have sinned. Right? That we've all come short of the glory of God. That the wages of sin is death. Right, And then he talked about the glorious gospel, what Jesus has done for us. And he says, because of Jesus and what he's done for us and what he offers us, that we are offered this hope. No condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Now, I just want us to, to, to think about the, the weight of that. And as we go back to Romans chapter 6, Paul put it like this. He says, the wages of sin is what? Say it out loud. Yes. Death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, when we think about this, we think about no condemnation, and we think about the weight of what this really means. Like, it's not going to make sense to you, and it's not going to make sense to me until I understand what it really means to be condemned. Right? The good news of the gospel isn't good news until we understand the weight of of what it is about. The wages of sin is death. A wage is what you earn. It's what you deserve. Right? And so Paul is going to over and over again contrast death and life. And he says sin equals death. Right? And death in the Bible is not just the end of something. Right? It's separation. And so physical death is the separation of our soul from our body. And spiritual death is the separation of our soul from God. 
And so Paul says the wages of sin, the result of sin, is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Christ, in the Messiah, says there is life, eternal life. Life that goes on forever. Resurrection life. And we're going to get further into that this week. But the result of what Jesus Christ has done for us, and if you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus as your Messiah, as your Lord, as your Savior, the weight of that means that you are no longer condemned. The wages of sin is death. You and I are guilty. And I think we could all just, you know, I know it's just the first day, but if we could just be honest this morning, right? We, we could all be honest and say, I know I've sinned, right? Would you be willing to admit that this morning? Can you raise your hand? All right, thank you. All right, everyone's hand. Like, the, the one thing, you know, all of us have different backgrounds. We all come from different places, different states, different countries. We all have different stories, right? Your story, my story is a little bit different. But one of the things that makes all of us the same is that we've all sinned. We've all rebelled against our Creator. And that leaves all of us under the judgment, the condemnation that we rightly deserve. It's what we've earned. It's what we deserved. It's what we get. And you and I deserve condemnation. We deserve the judgment of God. That, that's what we've earned. That's, that's right. But in Christ, the offer of the gospel is this. No condemnation. No judgment for your sin. And so that means if you're in Christ, if you've believed on Jesus as your Savior, presently now, the future reality is yours. There is no judgment, no condemnation for your sin. You will never be condemned by God. Because Jesus was condemned for you. And that is in an incredible, incredible hope. And as we think about possible and what is possible of our life, it begins with this truth. We are free. No condemnation. No judgment. And what does that mean? Well, that means that, that sin doesn't define you anymore. Right? Sin it does not define who you are. Your past, your mistakes, your shortcomings, we all have them, right? Right? But they don't define us anymore if we're in Christ. Our, our life is now defined by the reality of what God has done for us. No condemnation. Sin doesn't define me. It's not who I am. It's not my label. And because of that, there's an incredible possible marked over my life and over your life because of the gospel. I, I think this is so beautifully illustrated in, in a story that we read in the gospel of John. In John chapter 8. We read a story uh, of, of an encounter that Jesus had with some people. And just to set it up for you, Jesus was teaching in the temple, in the courtyard. And some religious leaders drag a woman into the service, right? Jesus is teaching and they drag her in. And they say, they, you know, and you know, of course the, the service sort of stops. And they drag this woman and they say, Jesus, we, we caught this woman in the act of adultery. Right? And their whole, their whole angle was that they wanted to catch Jesus. They wanted to trap him to get him to say something that they could ha get him on. And so they drag this woman in. They say, we caught her in the act of adultery. And, and they probably did, right? And, and we don't know for sure, but it's likely she may have been a prostitute, right? But they, they knew this woman. They knew where to find her. They knew how to catch her, right? And so they drag her in before Jesus. And they say, Jesus, we caught this woman in the act of adultery. And the law of Moses, it says that we should stone her. So she's, she's guilty, and they're ready to condemn her. And so they said, Jesus, what should we do? Well, Jesus just stoops down and begins to write in the dirt. Doesn't say a thing. Can you, I mean, just, can you imagine for a moment the, the, the tension of this moment? I mean, here's this woman. I mean, can you imagine how fast her heart is beating? Can you imagine the terror as she's been drugged through the streets, the harsh, angry accusations of these judgmental religious leaders? The tension is so thick. And the Bible says that, that the, the, these Pharisees just kept asking Jesus over and over again. They kept, they kept saying, what are you going to do? What do you say? And he's just writing the dirt. And then the Bible says that Jesus stood up. He stood up and he said, whoever is without sin can throw the first stone. And then it's, the Bible says he just stooped back down and kept writing. And then, one by one, beginning with the oldest, they dropped their rocks and they walked away. Now, what I want us to focus on this morning is what happens next. Because as they walk away, and it's just now her and Jesus left there, Jesus asks her a question. He says, where are your accusers? Where are your accusers? Does anyone condemn you? She said, no one. No one. 
And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Can you imagine what she felt in that moment? She was guilty. The law was in place to prescribe judgment for her sin. And Jesus steps in and says, neither do I condemn you. And then what does he say? Go, what? And sin no more. And when he said go and sin no more, he wasn't expecting her to go and be perfect. But he was saying, go and don't sin in this way anymore. Don't go back to the life that you just came from. Go and live a new life that's marked by the reality that you are no longer condemned. You see, the gospel, this message of, of no condemnation, it's not just a message of, okay, there's no judgment for your sin. You're not going to pay the penalty for your sin. That's great. But it also is an invitation to a new kind of life. And so let's continue back in Romans chapter 8, verse 2. Verse 2 says, Because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Now listen to that. Because you belong to him, Messiah, Jesus, right? If you're in Christ, you belong to God. He says, The power of the life-giving spirit, the Holy Spirit, has freed you, set you free from what? From the power of sin that leads to death. You are not condemned that you might live a new kind of life, no longer defined by your past, no longer defined by your sin, but defined by the righteousness of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ, on your behalf. And so we're free, free from condemnation, free from regrets. You know, I have a feeling that maybe all of us brought some regrets with us to camp. Some things that we would look back on in our life and say, I really wish I hadn't done that. I really wish that hadn't happened. All of us have regrets. But the hope for our regrets, right? We all have these if-only moments in life, right? Have you ever had an if-only moment? Anybody? Right? If only I hadn't been what? So stupid, right? If, if only I hadn't done that. If, if only I had known if if only. But here's the thing. God can take your if only regrets and turn them into what if possibilities. That's the power of the gospel. The gospel sets you free. No condemnation in Christ. Free from regrets. Free from our past. Look at verse 3 with me. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving us his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Verse 4. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. So let's just take a moment and, and sort of unpack this a little bit. Paul says, he says, the law of Moses, the law that God gave, the good law, he says it was unable to save us. Why? Because we were unable to keep the law, right? We, we have sin that we inherit, right, from our parents, and they inherited from their parents, and go all the way back to Adam and Eve, right? One of the things that you'll discover one day when you're parents is that you don't have to teach your kids how to sin, all right? You don't have to teach them how to lie. Right? It's, it's just amazing as they start to grow and develop and they start to figure this thing out and they by nature sin. Right? The law shows us our guilt, but it is powerless to save us. And so because the law was powerless to save us, look at what God did. It says, so God did what the law couldn't do. He did what? He sent his own son in a body like our bodies. The God of the universe, the eternal son of God, stepped out of eternity and out of heaven and into our world. Philippians chapter 2 says he humbled himself, right, and became a man. I mean, there, there, there's hardly any way that you and I could imagine the magnitude of that humility. That Jesus, the eternal Son of God, came into our world. And Philippians tells us that he didn't just come into our world, that he came into this world to die in our behalf. Look at, look at the text. He says he sent his own son in a body like our bodies, and in that body God declared an end to sin's control over us. How? By giving his son as a sacrifice for our sin. 
You see, you were condemned and you were guilty. and God had every right to, to judge you and to leave you under condemnation. Every right. Every right. The law leaves you guilty. But God in his incredible love. And listen, God loves you with a love that you cannot even fathom or understand. And in that immensity of God's love for you, he chose to give his son in your place. And so look at what it says. It says, in that body, God declared an end to sin's control of us by what? Giving his son as a sacrifice. Allowing his son to go to the cross. You see, Jesus went to the cross for you and for me and for the whole world. And the Bible says that there, God the Father allowed the Son to experience the horror and the wrath of our sin, of your sin, of my sin. And he was punished, he was condemned in your place and in my place. He was not guilty, he was innocent, he was without sin, but he took the guilt of your sin and of my sin and the sin of the world and he was condemned. And he suffered and he died in your place. And not only that, the father turned his back and forsook his son. In fact, on the cross, Jesus cries out. He says, he says my God, why have you forsaken me? Forsaken, abandoned. Why? So that he would never have to forsake or abandon you. I want you to know this morning the immensity of God's love towards you in Christ. Right? I mean... I mean, I can honestly say, I know a lot of you, I've known some of you for several years, some of you I'm just getting to know, but I can honestly tell you that I would be willing to give my life to save your life if there was danger. But I don't think that I would give up my son for any one of you. Fair deal? Are we clear on that? All right? So just know if it comes down to my son or you, it's you, okay? <laughs> just, just being honest, right? That's what we need to do. But God didn't make that decision. Instead, God chose to allow his son to suffer and to die for you so that you might be set free from the law of sin, so that you might be able to experience no condemnation and experience the freedom that is offered to you and I through the gospel and experience what it means to live a life now marked by a divine possible because you've been set free from the judgment that you so rightly deserved. Our possible begins by experiencing new life in Jesus. Your greatest need in life, your greatest need in life is to know and experience the forgiveness of sin that only Jesus can give you. Jesus made it very, very clear. And in our world of pluralism and syncretism and, and, and sort of relativism, Jesus' message is still clear and it's still true. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father. No one gets to God except what? Through me. Through Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. His death and resurrection are the only hope that we have to experience forgiveness of our sin, to experience the joy and the freedom of no condemnation, to experience life as it was meant to be lived, and to experience resurrection life one day with Jesus. That's our hope. And so your greatest need is to know and to believe and have faith in the one who can forgive you and to save you. The gospel is an invitation to be somebody that you never were. I really want you to, to get that thought. The gospel, the good news, right? The good news that, that even though we are condemned and even though we are sinful and even though we've rebelled and even though there's nothing good in us that makes us desirable or worthy to God, even though that's all true, the good news is that God loved you and he gave his son up for you. And that if you have faith and belief in Jesus, the Messiah, that God credits you with Jesus' righteousness. He adopts you into his family. He calls you his own. And he says, no condemnation now, no judgment. The judgment of your sin has been fully satisfied in my son Jesus. And based on his death and resurrection, I offer you new life, resurrection life. And so, it's my desire that, that all of you would really deeply grasp the gospel, the good news, because that's the starting point for this possible that's marked over your life. Listen, I believe that God has an incredible, incredible plan for your life, and I've been praying for you, and, and what I've been praying simply is this, that God would do for you in your time here what he did for me. And that was to give me a greater vision of who he was, a greater awareness of my, of my sin, a greater awareness of his grace, but also a greater awareness that God had greater plans for me than I could ever imagine for myself. And I believe that's true over every one 
of you. Why? Because you're God's, if you're in Christ, if you're Jesus, you're God's masterpiece. He created you anew in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. A divine possible. And that begins with the gospel, right? It begins with a recognition that you need grace, that you need Jesus. And I don't want any of you to, to come to this place and leave this place without knowing and understanding the truth about your sin and the judgment that it incurs, but the incredible forgiveness and grace that's offered to you in Jesus. There's no greater need that you have than to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And then, I want you to know that if you have regrets, if you've brought some regrets to camp, I want you to know that this is a great place to let go of those regrets. One of the worst things that we can do is to take our regrets, our shortcomings, our failures, and hang on to them. But isn't that our tendency sometimes? Have you ever done that? How many of you? Yeah, we carry them around like they're our new friend, right? They're a terrible friend. All right, don't make friends with your regrets. All right, don't make friends with your failures. Right, because in Jesus, there's a possible marked over your life. No condemnation. It, it's crazy, but even though you've failed, and even though you've messed up, and even though you've fallen short, there's no judgment, there's no condemnation in Messiah. And now Jesus says the same thing over your life that he said to that woman, John chapter 8. Go and sin no more. Go and live in the freedom. Go and live in the grace that I've given you. Jesus forgave you so that you could live a new kind of life. You see, this, this message of, of the gospel, this message of forgiveness, it, it's not just a message about going to heaven one day, right? We, so many times in so many circles, we've sort of reduced the gospel to, uh, do you want to go to heaven when you die? Mm, yeah, that sounds good. The other option's hell. Okay, I'll take heaven. All right. Well, then all you have to do is, is, is just say this prayer, and, and, then, and, and now you're going to go to heaven when you die. Oh, great. And then I just go on sort of living my life the way I live life, right? Pursuing my interests, my desires, my dreams, fulfilling me, right? Living life the way I live life. The message of the gospel is that you were created in the image of God, but you rebelled against him. But even though you rebelled, God came after you. He chased after you with his grace and his mercy and his love. And Jesus died on the cross, not just so that you could go to heaven, but so that you could know him. Right, so that you could experience his resurrection life in you here and now and for all of eternity that you could experience and share in his resurrection life so that you could serve and fulfill his purposes because God is king, right? He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords and he calls you into a relationship with himself where you would know him and love him and serve him and live for his purposes and so there's no condemnation that we get to live under. It's not just so that I can be free, it's so that I can be free to live for the glory of Jesus and the Father. That's the message of the gospel. I think you couldn't put it any better than Charles Wesley put it. He said this, this is verse 3 of N. Can It Be. He said, Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I awoke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. That's, that's it. That's, that's the message. He says, I was in prison, in sin, death. But then what happened? God woke me. He shared his grace with me. And he says, the dungeon flamed with light. He says, my chains fell off. And I think there's some imagery from Acts there, right? When Paul and, in the prison. And, and so he says, he says, this amazing imagery. But then he says, what? I rose, what? Went forth and followed you. That's the message of the gospel. And it leads us to verse 4. No condemnation. Now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Just, just look at that second line. Jesus, let's just break it down in two parts. Jesus is mine. That's the gospel. Jesus, he lives in you, right? He's with you. He loves you. Jesus and all that is his and all that he has is yours. You're alive in him, your head. And you're clothed in his righteousness. That's who you are. That's the message of the gospel. And that's the beginning of knowing the possible that's marked over your life. I just want you to, to bow your heads for a moment this morning. In, in just a moment of quiet reflection before we wrap up and launch out into our day. But I, I just want to ask you uh, this question. And, and I want you to wrestle with this question. Do you know Jesus as your Messiah? Do you know Jesus as your Savior, 
as your Lord? Has you ever come to a place where you've recognized who Jesus is? You've realized your sin, you've, 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 you've come to grips with that, and you've come to grips with the fact that Jesus really came to this earth. He lived for you. He lived a perfect life for you. Jesus lived a life that you could not live. He died the death that you deserve to die. He rose from the dead, victorious over death. He ascended into heaven where he sits at the right hand of his Father and he's coming again one day in power with great glory. And until that time, he invites men and women, boys and girls, to come into his kingdom to receive his forgiveness and his grace by placing their faith, their belief, their trust in him alone. And if you've never done that, I want to invite you to consider and to accept the invitation of Jesus. If you're here and you say, you know what, I... I I know that. I've accepted the invitation. I know I'm God's child. But I've got some pretty big regrets. And if that's you this morning, I just want you to know that Jesus offers you hope. You're not condemned. You're not going to face the judgment that you deserve. And if you have confessed and forsaken that sin, you can live now in freedom. You can let those things go. And I, I, I want this week, this time that you're here, to be a time where you say... There are some things that I kept brought with me, but I'm not going to take them home. I'm not going to pack them back up when I leave. I'm going to leave those regrets and live in the freedom that God has offered me. I just want you to picture for a moment Jesus. Now, I don't know how you imagine him to look. I don't know how you imagine him to, to be. But just as you picture or imagine Jesus, I just want you to, to imagine him looking at you right now. And I just want you to imagine him saying to you, what he said to that woman. Neither do I condemn you. It's true. It's true for you. And even on the days where it's hard to believe and it's hard to imagine and you don't feel you're worthy, you're not, but it's still true. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Father, I thank you for the privilege of, of your knowing your incredible grace. Father, I pray that, that every single one of us would be overwhelmed this morning by the freedom that you offer us through Jesus the Messiah. And Father, I pray that we would begin to discover the possible that's marked over our lives by living in this incredible freedom that you've offered. And Father, I pray that we would take this freedom as something to be taken for granted, but that we would see it as a launching point to an incredible life that you've called us to. And Father, I pray that you would do a powerful work in our lives this week. Father, I pray for the day that's ahead, for the challenges that will be faced today. Father, I pray for grace and for strength. I pray that as these students work hard, as they give themselves to study and to working and to practicing and learning, Father, I pray that they would do it for your glory and in light of the freedom that you've given them. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.